Good afternoon. It's a beautiful Thursday afternoon. And once again, you're welcome to the issues as it happens every 4 p.m. on Thursdays. And this is a program which has um, social accountability as a hallmark. Social accountability as a hallmark and addresses social developmental issues. And that's exactly what we'll be looking at this afternoon. This afternoon, we're looking at um, academia and industry, academia and industry. You know, there's this bridge. Are we, are they close or the gap is widening? What is happening? What should be done? What are we not doing right? What are we doing right? What, what, sh what, what, what do we have to think about? Are we there? Are we not there? Is the future that long or we can't even get there? These are questions we'll be looking at this afternoon. And to help me with this, um, discussion this afternoon. I have in the studio um, Professor Fred Mac Bagonluri. He is the Provost and the President of Academic City College, and he's also the founding dean of uh, engineering of Ashasi University. He has 22 patents, 22 patents, and he has 16 years in corporate America. 16 years in corporate America and working for Siemens USA. Now, Siemens USA does about $120 billion, $120 billion a year. $120 billion a year. And he worked for Siemens in the USA and BD Medical. If you know what BD Medical is all about, yes, he worked with them as well. So this man has an in-depth knowledge when it comes to um, um, the, the working field when it comes to what we're looking at this afternoon. And trust me, it's, a, it's going to be a very, very beautiful discussion um, this afternoon. Let me once again, sir, you're warmly, warmly welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. It's Prof, a pleasure to be here. Not too bad. Mm. Not too bad. You're okay. You're surviving the heat. You know. <laughs> but you've been in the country for a while. Yes, I've been back for almost four years now. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Right. So now let me go to my very first question and ask you. Okay. Academia mm -hmm. and industry. Mm -hmm. Would we ever bridge that gap? Bridge well, I think we need to start now. Um, I think up to this point in our history, you know, we've lost some of the industrial base that we had in the 60s and essentially has reverted to importing everything, including toothpicks um, mm. into this country, which mm. is quite regrettable. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity to do that. Um, there have been an upsurge in engineering education in Ghana. We've nicely renamed our Polytechnics Universities. Mm. Uh, so I think um, the intentions are good. You know, the, we just need to see the efforts. We mm. need to see how we can mm. converge, uh, uh, you know, these efforts into really industrializing. Okay. And I think, you know, the narrative is also shifting. Uh, the recent Peduasi Declaration, okay. um, some of the activities that are currently being spearheaded by the okay. Ghana Institution of Engineering um, indicates that there's a general interest okay. and that is the only pathway out of where we are today. Mm. Now, Prof, I know, I know you, you have a lot of experience when it comes to tertiary, the working field and, and, and all that. Mm -hmm. Now, sincerely, I yes. know you say like it has to be said, sincerely, yeah, yeah. how do you find university education in Ghana? I, know. Um, I, I think there's a, a complete disconnect. Mm. Um, I almost feel like industry is on the left-hand side and academia is on the other side. Mm. And so let me... Why, let, why do you say so? Let me tell you why. Okay. You know, one good place to start your developmental efforts should, also, should always pivot around what you are good at. Okay. So we have cocoa. Do we have any cocoa universities in Ghana? No. We just sow them, and harvest them, and sell them. We have our great colleges. Okay, but they're not, they not turning, they're not vertically integrated to the process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you need to start from your strengths. We have mining. We still import all this heavy equipment from abroad. Yeah. Uh, we have foreigners digging into our natural forests and destroying mm -hmm. them. So we need to start first from our points of strength. Okay. And if your university education is not addressing your strengths, then there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, I would think that, look, if anybody so in the world... So we're talking about the strengths of the country. Yes, if anybody wants to study anything on cocoa in mm. the world, it should come to Ghana. We should have the best university from research to production to everything you need to know about cocoa. We should. We should be the place where people go to learn about mining. Mm. Now, those are potential exports. 
foreign exchange, people coming in to learn these things. But we are not. We are not capitalizing on it. We actually depend on external help, you know, to get access to these raw materials. Now, we should have the best marketing platform. So our marketers should be able to sell cocoa to anybody else in the world. Yeah. So I think that, you know, if we were to go back and say, look, let's start from the areas that we are strong in and build up. Because all this brings in engineering, right? All yeah. this brings in science. Mm. All this brings in arts. All this brings in communication. And the best educational system, in my opinion, is where you can rally these cross-disciplinary areas together to develop. Mm. So now, you, you have told us what it has to be, what mm -hmm. it should be, what yeah, it can be. be. How do we do it? How, How do, do we achieve that? Yes. So I think what we need to do is to go back and look at the curriculum and then answer the simple question. Where do we want to go to where we are today? Mm. Now, if you go into typical industry, when I run product development for Siemens and for Beckton and Dickinson, in the same room, I have my engineers, I have my marketing people, I have my sales people, I have my operations people, I have my logistics people, I have my clinicians, all in the same room, thinking from the different cross-functional perspective how that product gets launched brainstorming. and successful. And brainstorming. Because one person cannot do it. Yeah. You know, but we still educate in silos. Mm. You know, I'm an engineer, and usually when you talk to somebody, you know, folks in Ghana, the first question they say, what kind of engineer are you? Are you? And I say, what kind of problem do you have? Because engineers are supposed to be problem solvers. And in industry, they are not discretized. On the okay. same project, you have a mechanical engineer. On the same project, you have an mm. electrical engineer. You, you, don't, you don't have portions of specialization? You don't have portions of specializations. Okay. Mm. It's, it's an African construct. People want okay. to tell you I'm a civil engineer. A civil engineer can teach a mechanical engineer fluids and teach a mechanical engineer structures. Mm. Try to do that in the universities here. They say, oh, you're a civil engineer, you can't teach mechanical. I say, really? Fluid is fluids. Whether it's in your body or it's in the river, mm. it's the same conservation of energy laws. Wow. You know, so I think we need to, we need to rethink it. We, we've, put, we've put too many barricades mm. in our own path. You know, we want only PhDs to teach in our universities, but we don't have them. We don't even produce enough. So you can be aspirational, <clears throat> but at the same time, you have to be realistic. Mm. You know, Legon has produced, the last time I checked, one PhD in mathematics. We have 120 tertiary educational institutions in Ghana. So if you say all mathematicians in those universities should have PhDs, and you can produce one in 70 years, when are you going to produce the rest? That's it. You have to be crazy to think that way. That's it. These are very serious issues. Very. I mean, are we giving priority to things like this? We're not. I think the policymakers are just excited to say, here are the number of roadblocks I've put in people's ways. Versus saying, how many roadblocks mm -hmm. have I actually removed? That we need to have baby steps, and we need to be realistic. It's okay to be aspirational, but you have to chart the pathway, and yeah. that pathway has to be defined within the context of realism. Mm -hmm. Now, Prof, give us, give us some case studies. Mm -hmm. Of, of changes mm -hmm. um, in global phenomenon when it comes to tertiary education. education. Can you give a, that shows that they are bridging that gap between yeah. academia and industry. industry. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I do at Academic City yeah. College, for instance, which I think is different from what I've seen anywhere else. And I've been to a lot of great institutions. Okay. I've actually been associated with at least seven universities mm. around the world. Okay. Did my PhD work at Princeton and got an MBA from MIT. Mm. And after 16 years in industry, I know a thing or two about engineering. Okay. So at Academic City, what we try to do is that in addition to your class projects, mm. at the end of the semester, we get all the faculty members together okay. to create one single project for the students to work on. Okay. So you have a group that has a marketing person on it, mm -hmm. has a communication person on it, mm. has an IT person on it, mm. and then the engineering students and they are, com they are working on their project, they are competing to see who comes up with the best project. Mm -hmm. And for me, look at, look at the things that can happen as a consequence, as a consequence of yeah. this process. Yeah. They can come up with prototype products that they can decide to develop into enterprise. Okay. So we are not just saying come to the university, go to classes, 
copy notes, regurgitate the notes, get a piece of paper, and adios. We're actually saying that for the four years you are here, you go out for an internship, which I think is the best practice. Go out there and see what is going on in industry. Do projects that builds your confidence. Because think about it, if you are a marketer, and in your first year, you're already in a team with potential group that you work with in real life, and they are asking you, as a marketing person working on this robot, for instance, how can you go to customers and interview them for their input? If you can do that for a robot, you can do that for pharmaceutical drugs, you can do that for frying yams, you can interview customers to do anything, and you learn to do that in your mm. first year. Mm. If you're a communication person on yeah. a project, you need to be able to pitch it. Mm. You need to be able to write about it. If you can do it in your first year, you can do it in a career. So we tool them from day one, and we say, this is how real life is. Learn it right now. And now you can say universities are not vocational institutions. I beg to differ. You have to educate based on your needs, not based on the aspirations of others. Mm. We are the ones that need to advance. It's not the Americans. So we, can't, we cannot, and, that, and, and just the last point to that. You know, American students have Boeing and GE to go do internships that helps them to integrate the stuff that you teach them in school. Yeah. We don't have those. So where else can you do this than in the institutions? That's why we need lab equipment. That's why we must not watch our lab equipments gather dust. We have to use them. Because if a kid can use a lathe machine in the university, mm. they can use the lathe machine when they go to gratis. Yeah. They can yeah. use the lathe machine when they go to CSIR. Mm. So you are actually empowering them, and that's yeah. what we should do. We should yeah. do more of those. But there's this notion that of like most students that go to university mm -hmm. are going there to acquire that academia skills mm -hmm. just to pass out and work with government. Yeah. Is that what we're seeing? Now, yeah. How can we change that? Yeah. Well, so I, I think we need to change the narrative itself. Because for long, we tell kids that the pathway into society is a nice university education and a good job. Mm -hmm. A good job created by somebody else. Mm. Now, I'll tell you a short story. I had a friend from Rwanda who worked at an electroplating company near Wright Patterson Air Force Base okay. in Dayton. Okay. And so when he was about <coughs> finishing his master's, his boss called him up and said, Bernard, um, now that you're about to graduate, what are your plans? And he said, oh, you know, I've applied for a couple of jobs. He said, you've applied for jobs? He said, yes. He said, why do you guys always keep talking about applying for jobs? Do you know how I started this company? He said, no. This was my high school project. Ew. He said, I wasn't the brainy type. Mm -hmm. I couldn't read properly. But I had to survive. So I started looking at opportunities when I was in secondary school. And this yeah. was my electroplating project. And I've turned it into a $10 million industry, oh. doing work for the United States Air Force. So you guys need to stop talking about going to look for jobs. Yeah. Sometimes you're holding the jobs in your own hands, and you don't even know it. Hmm. So why, why, why can we think on those lines? Yeah. Is, this, is this the culture? Is mm -hmm. this the, is it attitude? Is mm -hmm. it, do we blame anyone? Yeah, so I'll tell you. Let me, let me propose a couple of ideas here. Yeah. So one, if you look, if you look at our tertiary educational system, mm across the board. We take our best and brightest, send them abroad to go to graduate school, do their masters, do their PhD, they come back and we put them in the classroom. Yeah. They have no real life experience, zero. Now they teach the same way that they were taught. A fish only knows how to swim. If you take it out of water, it dies. Mm. So if you've never, ha I mean, how can you be a preacher if you're not inspired? Well, I guess you can, but <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you, can. <laughs> you know, but how can you teach something that you have never lived, you have yeah. never experienced, yeah. you have never faced a challenge? When you teach engineering, you should be able to look at the students and say, when I worked on that project, these were the challenges that we have, mm -hmm. you know? And so I tell my students, you measure, you measure again, 
You measure the third time, and when you are about to cut, you measure again. Mm -hmm. And that is from experience, that you can never be careful enough. So I think we have to look at the people that are walking into the classroom and teaching our children and say, what are they teaching them? That's one. Two, you know, I met a student recently at the Haxa conference mm -hmm. who stood up and said, I just got a, a, a bachelor's degree in engineering, and I didn't even finish my project, mm -hmm. but I got a degree. Mm -hmm. And my project was even farther than most people who also graduated. So somebody said, how did you graduate then? He said, we were so many assigned to one faculty member, and we were like a conveyor belt. They just graduated us just and let go. Two, yeah. Now, what I would do is, that project, <coughs> before you even work on that project, I want to understand the market viability of that project. And that, is there an opportunity for you to take that project into enterprise? Mm. I'm not going to allow you to work on a project for the sake of a project. I'm going to make you work on a project that could make you a millionaire. Yeah. So that's what we need to see. We need mm. to start thinking about opportunity. And it's not just a Ghana. That aspect is not just Ghana's problem. If you go to many universities across the world, students cannot finish to finish their projects and walk away. But the opportunity we have here is to say, how do we not do that? How do we ensure that actually. our students can actually spend the last year or the last two years of college actually developing a project that they can create businesses out of that will hire other people? Mm. That is important. And that is, that's the philosophy that we need to drive versus, you know, can I get a job at customs? Mm. Can I get a job at mm. immigration? Because those are the avenues that will propel me into higher society. Wow. I don't know what your pedagogy declaration was about or what yes. came out of it, but yes. um, do you think we should re-look at our curriculum again when it comes to tertiary? Mm -hmm. Should we look at it again? Yes, I think we should. I think, you know, there's a declaration. So. Um, the declaration was um, a convergence that at this current stage of development, at the level on, of unemployment that we have in this country today, industrialization is one of the events that we need to develop. Yeah. So I went back and I started developing a new curriculum on industrial and systems design. Okay. That if, if, if the next generation of graduates are going to come and interplay in this new industry. We need to prepare them. Mm. So I think, you know, Peduase tells us that, you know, government at the highest level because the president came. Okay. The minister for Mesti was there. His special assistant was there. There were 50 Ghanaian scientists and engineers across the world. Mm. Um, and so I think it's serious. Okay. I think it's serious because we don't really have any options. Okay. Now, the, there's a notion that Industry players know what they want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why mm -hmm. don't they feed tertiary, um, mm -hmm. tertiary institutions mm -hmm. what they are looking for? Mm -hmm. And then we churn these students mm -hmm. out who would therefore go and propel the industries. Mm -hmm. Should they play a role mm -hmm. in this? So the, the answer is yes. The answer is obviously yes. Um, there are opportunities for industry to engage with universities. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of good universities have industry advisory boards. Okay that input into what the next generation of curriculum needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, it is also quite interesting that in other parts of the world, technologies come into academia from industry. Technologies come from academia. So most companies like Siemens would outsource projects to universities like University of Elagon and say, can you start looking 10, 20 years ahead where these technologies are going to head, and how can we bring them into industry? Okay. So I think it's a bi-directional relationship, um, and we need to strengthen that as well. Now, you would say in this part of the world, we don't really have that many industry. Mm -hmm. So I really think that academia can actually propel industry in this part of the world. And I made mention earlier that if we can start getting students actually taking their projects into enterprise, those are the industries yeah. also. Yeah. So I think there should be some good handshaking, and mm. we are not doing much of that mm. right Prof, now. What, what, what do you think of, mm -hmm. yet again, mm -hmm. what do you think of industries training the needed manpower they need? So mm -hmm. they, they, they've come out of universities or some mm -hmm. tertiary university, mm -hmm. and they are with you. Mm -hmm. okay, but you know you need this kind of um, strength from that person, from these persons. Mm -hmm. Why can't they train them themselves? Train the manpower. Okay. Because the, can the, we do that? The industries train yes. manpower. The industries train manpower. Without universities involved. Yes. 
I, I think it will be very difficult. I think industry can train technicians. Or even you pass out from a university, <laughs> but you go find yourself in some yeah. industry. Yeah. Can they train you? Oh, yeah. So okay. I, I think one of the things we need to do well with at the university is to give these kids employable skills. Okay. Okay. So if you look at the gas and oil industry, mm -hmm. um, they will take electrical engineers, they will take mechanical engineers, they will take chemical engineers, and they train them. They train them. I mean, there's opportunity to be trained. And if you are in the technical area, actually training is your middle name. You should be able to be trained to do multiple mm -hmm. things, right? And so, but you, can't, you, you, you have to be able to train somebody who is trainable. So we need to make sure that they are training ready in order to do that, which means that, you know, they need to know how to use a few tools. You know, I, I was speaking to Dr. Victor Obeng, who went to work for Dow Corning when he finished university. Mm -hmm. And his boss, the first thing that his boss did was give him a toolkit. Mm -hmm. And he said there was a spanner in there, some screwdriver, and said, this son is going to be your best friend in this place. Mm -hmm. So the industry itself, Dow Corning is a major Fortune 500 company, or maybe Fortune 100. It's already presuming that you have some hands-on yeah. skills that allows you to use that, those two yeah. kits. And if you couldn't, then you will not survive in that environment. Mm -hmm. So we need to prepare them, you know. <laughs> Prof, <laughs> yes, sir. can we also have <laughs> industry players mm -hmm. get themselves into universities? I mean, infiltrate the, the universities, follow, um, 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 go through, see what is being taught. Yes. Can, should, can we have yes. that? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I started my conversation by yeah. saying that if you're not producing enough PhDs, mm -hmm. you got to be a realist. Yeah. yeah. When I was at MIT, mm. one of the guys that taught my class, which was 14 years experience average, there were seven MBAs already in that class, mm -hmm. there were seven PhDs already in that class, mm -hmm. and the guy that taught us managing in adversity had a bachelor's degree. Wow. wow. And yet, he had built and sold two companies for $10 billion each. So now, who can teach you yeah. Managing in adversity better than somebody who has been there and done it. Mm. Now you give me a PhD in entrepreneurship fresh from some university somewhere versus this guy. I'll take that guy anytime because he knows what he's talking about. He's not going to come and sing and dance. You know, so we need to put them in there. We need to have room for industrial players to be in our classroom mm. sharing real life experiences with us. Okay. And we need that. We need that now. I think that's a major gap in our educational system. Yeah. Because we can't even frame them. We keep calling them tutors. We call them research assistants. Because yeah. we are afraid to call them lecturers. Because yeah. they don't have PhDs. And that yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So do, do you see yourselves having this happen very soon? C could, it, could, could it happen? I invite industrial players into my classroom. You do? I invite them. Mm. If you're an entrepreneur, that's one of sitting over there. Yeah. Mr. The guy doing the Mr. Valentin, he's, he's there. He's been mm. talking to my students forever. Yeah. One of my students spent most of the summer with him, shadowing him. Mm. And who else knows more about artificial intelligence right now in this country but Valentin? Okay. Okay. We have to go to the source. All right. Now, for the benefit of some of, of most of the viewers who are watching, some yes. of the viewers who are watching, mm -hmm. when we say industry, mm -hmm. What are we looking for? What are we looking at? Are we looking at the white collar job? Are we looking at some job being created by some other, some foreigner, some mm -hmm. foreign person, mm -hmm. or a blue collar job, mm -hmm. or ourselves? What what really do we mean when we say industry player? I think it's across the board, from mm. the white collar to the blue collar to the black collar, mm. um, from making toothpick all the way to driving airplanes. For me, that is all this. That's that's the spectrum. Um, most graduates coming out of universities find their way fast into the blue collar sector. Okay. A few of them with time and experience will make it to white collar yeah. jobs. And then we say, how come the white collar guys who don't do too much work make more money than the blue yeah. collar guys, right? Yeah. The problem is that the ability to think, to deploy strategy is very expensive. That's why they make more money. But yeah. it's, a, it's a spectrum. Um, and you can have small, medium, and large industries, mm -hmm. right? But that all constitutes this, you know, the definition of industry. Okay. If you are making a widget and selling the widget, you are an industry. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, very interesting discussion that we were looking at uh, bridging the gap between um, academia and industry. And uh, we have on the studio Professor Mark Bagunluri, and he's really, really, really taking us through this. And um, on this note, we'll take a little break and um, we'll be right back. <coughs> How are we doing? You're doing so good, Prof. Thank you. Stand in the gap for the well-being of God's people as a nation. What do we want to achieve in governance, religion, sociocultural front, and national development as a whole? What is the extent of progress made? What are the obstacles on our way? Are we losing our sense of nationalism, integrity, mutual respect, discipline? as a country. What can we do to achieve our desired state? What legacy must we leave behind for the next generation? These and many more questions will be answered on what is next. And that is what what is next seek to bring to you that together we find relevant answers to contemporary challenges. What is next? Coming soon on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana with your host, Kwabino Puni from Pong. God bless our homeland, Ghana. So in the spiritual law as well, the fact that you have started something does not mean that you will automatically conclude. No, because between beginning and the end, there is a gap. A lot of things are going to happen. Difficulties are going to come. Discouragements will come. People will say all kinds of things. But you must remain focused. What are people praying for? We are praying for our enemies. And the prayer is God, kill our enemies. The church today should not be praying that kind of prayer. That is why the Bible says, let God arise and let his enemies scatter. Understanding to the many questions, God has chosen the church as salt and light to bring hope and transformation. For this reason, Pentecost R, a sponsored broadcast by the Church of Pentecost, brings you God's undiluted word with simplicity, clarity, and understanding. Our theme for this year. I will build my church, seeks to build a church called out to become God's own possession and sent out to witness, serve and possess the nations. When we are talking about possessing the nations, we are talking about being filled in the spirits, such that you are a sacred go-between, between you and God. That you wake up drunk with the spirit, that you don't see anything, but you see God and possessing the land. Welcome to Pentacles R, equipping the church to possess the nations. Pentacles R, God's timely word for our dying world. Oh, I'm so sorry, Miss, but I really need a job right now. Please. She's the star of the nightclub, and she's a nanny of seven sports kids. One row falls in the daytime, the other at night. Yet both are the same star. My heart is yours. You know I don't know much about children, mother. No way! No way! 
trouble, fun, a family, but most of all, true love. Go on and dance, cause you owe me hard cash. Trained to catch a millionaire. The nanny wins Fernando's heart. If Anna tries to steal Fernando from me, I swear I'll... My heart is yours. Hit your screens from Monday to Friday, every week at 9 p.m. and on Saturdays at 8 p.m. My Heart is Yours is brought to you by Adonko, High Sense, and Deluxe Paint. <laughs> Do you want to have an encounter with God? Are you hungry for God's word and for signs of his transforming power in your life? If you need a touch from the Almighty, make a date with Positive R only on GTV every Tuesday morning. Join the General Overseer of the Positive Gospel Church, Reverend Frank Odoi Sarkodie, and his vibrant congregation every Tuesday at 5.30 a.m. only on GTV. You can also worship with Positive Gospel International Church at all their branches in and outside Ghana at these times. Positive R. Get a touch from God only on GTV. chapter 22 verse 30 the Lord called his people to stand in the gap for the well-being of God's people as a nation what do we want to achieve in governance religion sociocultural front and national development as a whole what is the extent of progress made what are the obstacles on our way are we losing our sense of nationalism integrity mutual respect discipline as a country what can we do to achieve our desired state what legacy must we leave behind for the next generation these and many more questions will be answered on what is next and that is what what is next seek to bring to you that together we find relevant answers to contemporary challenges. What is next? Coming soon on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana with your host, Kwabino Puni from Pong. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Right, that was a promo on what is next. Just a, um, um, a program that's about to hit the airwaves of GTV, and you wouldn't want to miss that when it starts rolling. If you just joined us, you're watching the issues that happens every Thursday at 4 p.m., and um, we're looking at building, bridging the gap between academia and industry. And uh, we have in the studio um, Professor Fred McBagonluri, um, Provost and President of Academic, Academic City um, College, and he's really, really telling us what, what the whole picture looks like. It's kind of scary, kind of very scary. But before I go back to him, we have this feature to play. Let's watch this and we'll come back. I once said, everybody's a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today on trial we have modern day schooling. Glad you could come. Not only does he make fish climb trees, but also makes them climb down and do a 10-mile run. Tell me, school, are you proud of the things you've done? Turning millions of people into robots, do you find that fun? Do you realize how many kids relate to that fish swimming upstream in class, never finding their gifts, thinking they are stupid, believing they are useless? Well, the time has come. No more excuses. I call school to the stand and accuse him of killing creativity, individuality, and being intellectually abusive. He's an ancient institution that has outlived his usage. So, Your Honor, this concludes my opening statement. And if I may present the evidence of my case, I will prove it. Proceed. Exhibit A. Here's a modern-day phone. Recognize it? Here's a phone from 150 years ago. Big difference, right? Stay with me. Here's a car from today. And here's a car from 150 years ago. Big difference, right? Well, get this. Here's a classroom of today. And here's a class we used 150 years ago. Now, ain't that a shame? In literally more than a century, nothing has changed. Yet you claim to prepare students for the future? But with evidence like that, I must ask, do you prepare students for the future? 
or the past. I did a background check on you and let the record show that you were made to train people to work in factories, which explains why you put students in straight rows, nice and neat, tell them sit still, raise your hand if you want to speak, give them a short break to eat, and for eight hours a day, tell them what to think. Oh, and make them compete to get an A. A letter which determines product quality. Hits grade A of meat. I get it. Back then, times were different. We all have a past. I myself am no Gandhi. But today, we don't need to make robot zombies. The world has progressed. And now we need people who think creatively, innovatively, critically, independently, with the ability to connect. See, every scientist will tell you that no two brains are the same. And every parent with two or more children will confirm that claim. So please explain why you treat students like cookie cutter friends or snap back hats, giving them this one-size-fits-all crap. Watch your language. Sorry, Your Honor, but if a doctor prescribed the exact same medicine to all of his patients, the results would be tragic. So many people would get sick, yet when it comes to school, this is exactly what happens, this educational malpractice where one teacher stands in front of 20 kids, each one having different strengths, different needs, different gifts, different dreams, and you teach the same thing the same way? That's horrific. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendant should not be acquitted. This may be one of the worst criminal offenses ever to be committed. And let's mention the way you treat your employees. Objection. Overruled. I want to hear this. It's a shame. I mean, teachers have the most important job on the planet, yet they're underpaid? No wonder so many students are short-changed. Let's be honest. Teachers should earn just as much as doctors, because a doctor can do heart surgery and save the life of a kid, but a great teacher can reach the heart of that kid and allow him to truly live. See, teachers are heroes that often get blamed, but they're not the problem. They work in a system with Without many options or rights, curriculums are created by policymakers, most of which have never taught a day in their life. Just obsessed with standardized tests, they think bubbling in a multiple choice question will determine success. That's outlandish. In fact, these tests are too cruel to be used and should be abandoned, but don't take my word for it. Take Frederick J. Kelly, the man who invented standardized testing, who said, and I quote, these tests are too cruel to be used and should be abandoned. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if we continue down this road, the results will be lethal. I don't have much faith in school, but I do have faith in people. And if we can customize health care, cars, and Facebook pages, then it is our duty to do the same for education, to upgrade and change and do away with school spirit, because that's useless. Unless we're working to bring the spirit out of each and every student, that should be our task. No more common core. Instead, let's reach the core of every heart in every class. Sure, math is important, but no more than art or dance. Let's give every gift an equal chance. I know this sounds like a dream, but countries like Finland are doing impressive things. They have shorter school days. Teachers make a decent wage. Homework is non-existent, and they focus on collaboration instead of competition. But here's the kicker boys and girls their educational system outperforms every other country in the world other places like singapore are succeeding rapidly schools like montessori programs like khan academy there is no single solution but let's get moving because while students may be 20 percent of our population they are 100 percent of our future so let's attend to their dreams and there's no telling what we can achieve this is a world in which i believe a world where fish are no longer forced to climb trees. I rest my case. That's my case. He just sued the school system. He just sued the school system. <laughs> That's very deep. Prof, I can yes. see you're, you're enjoying this. Yes, I am. <laughs> now, based, based on what we just saw, mm -hmm. that beautiful, beautiful um, um, feature we just saw, saw right now, do you think our school system, university system, is a bit rigid? Uh, yes, I think it is. I, I think some of the curriculum obviously outdated. Um, I think, you know, when I talk to parents, I tell them, look, this, this generation of kids are the brightest that ever walk on this planet. Mm. And sometimes parents will look at me and say, this one here is smarter than I am. And I say, yes, it's smarter than you. They say, how so? And then I remove my smartphone. I said, anytime you have problems, with this sure. thing, who helps you out? Sure. Can you type? Can you type with both hands? <laughs> Can you type with your feet? Can you use two phones at the same time? They are so brilliant and they are anxious. They are eager to learn. They have short attention spans. Mm. And so if we go back and try to teach them the way that we were taught, 
we lose them completely. We need to adapt. They want to touch stuff. They want to feel stuff. They want to experience it. They don't want to hear Anansi stories. Okay. So I think the classroom environment itself needs to change to accommodate this new generation. They are not lazy. These kids are bright. They don't want us to teach them the way that we were taught. Okay. So I think we need to come up with new pedagogies, new methodologies of developing. And so when I say they want to touch and feel, it means they want project-based learning. Okay. They want experiential learning. They want contextual learning. They want to solve problems that are prevalent in our environment. Mm -hmm. They want you to give them knowledge that they can extend to <laughs> other stuff. So I think we need to reshape the way that we actually handle the classrooms. And if you have 300 students, for goodness sake, in one class, that personal engagement is lost. It is. It really is. Yeah. Now, um, Prof, uh, decision by government to convert mm -hmm. polytechnics mm -hmm. to technical universities yeah. Was it one way of bridging that gap mm -hmm. between academia and industry? Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on that? So it's quite interesting to me. I mean, I've had the opportunity to visit a couple of these new technical universities, mm -hmm. and I asked myself, was there an, a need for a name change? Why, why, that, why that question? I mean, a polytechnic, a university, an institute, a dog by any name. Yeah. <laughs> it's still one. You know, I think the focus should be what are our national imperatives? Our technical universities alone should not be vehicles for producing, bridging the gap. All our universities should it be. It could be one way of doing that. We, well, I don't, I don't know what it has achieved because I can actually tell you I visited a technical university and I rubbed my hands on their brand new German equipment and there was dust on it. It's not being used? It's not being used. And I said, do you have an operating manual for this equipment? And they didn't know where it was. And even the lights in the workshop were out. Mm. So what is really the essence of it? Mm. Because if you have the equipment, you must use them. Mm. But here's the secret. I think once we put metrics around them, once we start challenging them on the quality, measuring the quality of the students from an industry perspective, getting feedback as to what they are producing, we may get some improvement. Okay. But I, I don't think anything fundamental has actually changed from changing the names. Okay. Prof, I, I would call this, um, I would call this, um, we, we're giving priority, or would you say that we're giving priority to grammar education, mm -hmm. where it's all theory, we'll just mm -hmm. go the theory, learn, but by parts and mm -hmm. all that, mm -hmm. speaking good, mm -hmm. good English, it's all, it's all grammar, it's all That's theory. Right. That's right. But we are not tapping into technical and vocational yeah. um, education skills. Yes. Is that yeah. one of the problems? I think that's one of the problems. I think um, when I was growing up, what, there was the notion that the folks that went to vocational school and technical schools were the autistic ones. You know, they were yeah. not really yeah. prepared or brilliant those enough. Were not to have, they were not bright yeah. enough. And then I went to engineering school, and when I had to draw, I was like, oh, goodness, I never took technical drawing. So I think there's a fundamental disconnect, disconnect between our aspirations and our emphasis. Mm. And we have to demystify that. I think we need to focus strongly on vocational education because the, the countries that we try to benchmark ourselves yeah. against have yeah. done a good job in that direction. Mm. Um, grammar education traces all the way to the heydays of Cambridge and Edinburgh and Oxford when our people came back and speak big English. Mm. Now we need to build stuff. Yeah. The time for big English is over. Now it's time for reality. We've got to stand up to it. Now, the next question where you also come into play um, is captains of industry. Yeah. Okay, We have captains of industry. We have the entrepreneurs, the big men out there, the businessmen out there. Mm -hmm. How well are they addressing this issue mm -hmm. of, of bridging that gap between academia mm -hmm. And, and, and industry. I mean, talk of, talk of the Ghana Employers Association, the AGI, the Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. the TUC, mm -hmm. yourself, mm -hmm. and, and all other persons. Mm -hmm. What are you doing, about, doing this? about this? I mean, you could go for the conferences mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. and all that, mm -hmm. but these things are on the shelves. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me tell you this. I have met a few Ghanaians from the diaspora who spend every summer here um, teaching real engineering in our universities. Okay as a way to contribute to this discourse. Okay. Uh, professor Oseo Asari, who is a distinguished professor at the University of Pennsylvania, okay. is one mm -hmm. point. I know Dr. Kwame Boachi, um, who was president of Ghana Institutions of Engineering. He has been a strong advocate of this industry 
in, um, acad academia okay. um, partnership. Okay. And he actually has a, a quote that is quite interesting. He says, you know, we suffer, as Ghanaians, we, we suffer from individual excellence and group incompetence. Okay. And mm. we, we need to fix that because mm. individually we, so can, we can knock our chest and say, you know, I'm the real deal. Mm. But then you put us together and nothing happens. Yeah. Um, Dr. Fripon Boatin, who is a minister for Mesti, has been a very active advocate. You know, you know, he's a surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon, but he has also been a champion of science and has been driving um, the, you know, the new innovation policy, among other things. And yeah. in the meetings that I've gone to, he's chaired most of them himself. So I think collectively, there is that enthusiasm. And Sam Jonah recently spoke yeah. about how we should, we should build industries that should be Ghanaian institutions, something that we should st stand behind. So the rhetoric is there. I think the efforts are there. I think recently we saw the government actually stepping in to say industrialization is the, is the way to go. So as the Chinese will say, you know, um, the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago, but the next best is today. So I think baby steps uh, should take us somewhere. Mm. Now, th this is a very interesting question I'm about to ask. Mm -hmm. We're talking about bridging the gap between um, um, academia and industry. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, mm -hmm. what is industry expecting from mm -hmm. academia? Mm -hmm. And what's the academia expecting from industry? Mm -hmm. So right now, we've, we've configured the kids to believe that when they graduate, they have to go out there and look for jobs. Mm -hmm. So academia is focused on churning out graduates who are employable. Now, whether they have employable skills or not, it's a different question. I think industry that is quite limited also is expecting kids to come and do plug and play. But there's also a part that they need to play that you need, sometimes you need to reconfigure these kids to work in industry. So I think the expectations are a little bit misaligned. When you talk to industry people, they'll say, oh, the students that we are receiving are not ready. And then when you go to academia, academia will argue that we are not a place to produce vocational skills. So I think they, they just need to come together and set that expectations. And I think an industry advisory board is one mechanism, one vehicle. I think getting industry people into the classrooms to talk to students about what is really happening in the, in the real world is another, um, but I think we need to talk. I mean, we, th we need to find an avenue where there should be convergence, okay. and it's currently not there. Okay. Now, um, Prof, let me ask you this. Academic yeah. um, City College. Yes. If I am working, yeah. let's say I'm working, mm -hmm. and I come to the college, mm -hmm. what do I gain? What do I mm -hmm. benefit? Mm -hmm. If I am not working, mm -hmm. and I come there, mm -hmm. what do I get as well? So when you say working, you're an employer somewhere, employer and somewhere. you come into my school. Yes. Um, so right now, I don't have part-time, so that would be a part-timer. Okay. Um, we don't have part-time. It's completely undergraduate, four years, full admission. Okay. But if you come to Academic City College, here's what you get. Mm. You get four key things in our pillars. One is contextual learning. And what do I mean by that? So before, sorry for sure. your thoughts. Mm -hmm. and if I'm, if I'm just mm -hmm. an ordinary student, yes. do you have various... Programs, programs, programs yeah. yes. Okay. So we have engineering, um, we have mechanical engineering, we have electrical, electronics engineering, we have electronics and communication engineering, we have computer engineering. Okay. And then on the art side, we have um, journalism and mass comm, okay. and public relation and advertising. Mm. And then on the business side, we have banking and finance, marketing, uh, we have HR, and then we have, um, I think those are the courses mm, mm. that we have. Okay. And these are very practical? These are very, very, practical, very practical. Practical. Mm. They are hands-on. Um, they are integrated. Uh, you will solve local problems. You would, if you're a communications person, we're going to make sure that you interview somebody like you. You write an article. Mm. Uh, we make sure that you work in a team so that you can write about things that you're not familiar with, try to learn about new yeah. things. If you're an engineering student, yeah. you're going to stand in front of a faculty member who is going to build a bulldozer out of cardboards wow. and say, this is how a bulldozer works. If you are in a group, you're going to work on a robotic project that you have never seen before, but it is not to scare you. It's to actually allow you to build the confidence mm. to tackle new things. Mm. So y y your graduates, how well are they doing? So we've just gone through our first year. Okay. Um, so it's all aspirational. Mm. Okay. But the ultimate objective is when we send them out there, we'll still follow up with our, your employers and find out 
what we can do better. Sure, sure. Right, so now my next question. Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so like on my heart. Mm -hmm. It's been a thing I've been talking about for a very long time nowadays. Mm -hmm. We have the professors, mm -hmm. we have students, mm -hmm. we have you. You mm -hmm. write beautiful research words, mm -hmm. beautiful projects, be all the mm -hmm. nice things. Yeah. We put them on the shelves on the university, so the four corners of the university world. Yeah. Industry yeah, players, serious. do they come for these works? Do they work with these works? Mm -hmm. Do they yearn for it? Do they mm -hmm. even call for mm -hmm. it? What mm -hmm. are we doing with these research works? Yes, that's, a very, that's, that's, that's actually a global problem. Okay, For you to solve this, you have to be deliberate about how you go about it. You can't leave it to chance. You can't leave a dissertation mm. sitting on a shelf hoping that one day somebody will discover it. You can't leave it to chance. You can't leave it to yeah. chance. You have to have deliberate structures around it. So if you look at institutions like MIT and Stanford, they have technology licensing offices. Okay? So I could walk to a licensed office at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and say I am interested in looking for finding a project here that I can take into enterprise, okay. okay? There will be somebody there to guide you. Which area are you looking for ideas? Is it biomedical? Is it mechanical? Is it fluids? Whatever it is. And then you, they'll give you that portfolio. You go through that portfolio, you identify the project that you're looking for, They'll tell you what the property rights are, they'll mm -hmm. tell you about the percentages that MIT is gonna take from you and for how long. And then you go out there and you know what? you get MIT students coming to help you on internships to build that enterprise. Okay. So what we need to do is basically to create that ecosystem where we can facilitate ideas transition from okay. academia into industry or even from industry, ideas coming from industry into academia for further research work. Uh, explain further on idea yes. transition. Yeah. Well, when you say ideas transition, what do yes. you mean? So I mean, you know, academia produces new knowledge. Mm. But industries are also at the forefront of taking those ideas and projecting them mm. into products and developing new enterprises out of them. Okay. Most of the time, in the course of that transition, mm -hmm. new ideas develop around them, sure. whether from regulatory perspective, whether from quality control perspective. And then they take those ideas and bring them back to academia and say, here are challenges that we are having. Can you help us resolve them? Mm. So unless we have this bi-directional relationship where there's input from academia to industry, and there is input sure. from academia. That fluid. That mm. fluid, it has to be fluid. Mm. If it is not, then we don't have a functioning um, mm. system. Prof, can we have in the near future where mm. all final years, let's say all final year students mm -hmm. are made to, let's say I'm doing theater arts, or mm -hmm. I'm doing um, sociology, or I'm doing mm -hmm. one of these courses. Mm -hmm. And my final year project, mm -hmm. I'm, Every student is being made to, you look at what the industry player is looking for, mm -hmm. what pertains in the theater world, what mm -hmm. they need. Mm -hmm. And we make a student in your final year project mm -hmm. write the challenges being faced, the mm -hmm. solutions and all that. Mm -hmm. Can we, in some time to come, mm -hmm. see a thing like that, where your final year project mm -hmm. has to feed industry? Absolutely. So I'll tell you one interesting thing we did a couple of years ago at Ashasi University. We actually brought industry players male, female, young, old, retired, still working. And we put them in the same room with first year engineering students. Wow. And we asked the students to interview them mm -hmm. about their careers, the challenges, the frustrations, you know. And then two things happen after that. One, you write a reflection paper of the experience. And the second thing is that you need to vote on one local problem from the interview. The class has to vote and say, this is a local problem that we are going to solve. First year students. And the first time we did it, it was at the peak of Dumso. And the wow. kids decided that they were going to build a portable solar charger. Okay. And in groups of five, 20 of them, they all built a product. Now, they were not hot and sexy, you know? But they work, because you have to hook up your laptop to it and charge it, mm. your phone to it. And you know, these kids, they value those things. Yeah. So the warning is that if you don't design your systems properly, you'll, you'll okay, fry your own laptop and your phone. And they did that. So I think we need to do more of these local problems and let them understand that engineering is not something you apply in Alaska. Prof, so um, we enjoying the talk, but unfortunately, <laughs> time is really up. No we problem. need to go. Um, no just problem. a sentence, your last sure. word in a sentence. Yeah. So I think um, Ghana is headed in the right direction. I think we need to converge our resources. We need to change our mindset. We need to integrate our resources. 
and we can build an industrialized society in my lifetime. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank my you pleasure. very, very much. Uh, I've been talking to uh, Professor Fred Mac Bagunluri. Um, he's a president of Provost for the Academic City College, and uh, we'll be looking at um, academia and the industry bridging that gap. There's a lot more work to do, a lot of work to be done. But like he says, there should be that transition. It should be fluid, and we're going to get there. Right, so we're coming away next week, Thursday, God willing, at 4 p.m. with the issues. Um, it's been nice having you, and um, take care, and Godspeed.